years ago, Beacon Hill and the Back Bay consisted of elegant townhouses reserved for Boston's elite. The sifted few, said Oliver Wendell Holmes, where fashionable gatherings were a way of life. Tea in the afternoon, balls at night. But the end of World War I brought change, more immigrants and new attitudes. The city of Boston had a lot of folks who in their sense of uh, the genteel way of life understood that some of the immigrants who were coming into the city back in the 20s should be cared for in a more personal way and given opportunity to socialize. With that, the International Institute of Boston was born, housed first on Newbury Street, then Beacon, and finally Commonwealth Avenue. For more than 70 years, newcomers have been welcomed and shown the way as they made the transition to life in America. It kind of holds their hands. They teach them English, they take them around so they can see what the work ethic in the United States of America is. So it really is a wonderful organization that helps people that need that help most. In keeping with its Brahmin ancestry, the Institute, too, had fashionable gatherings. Erna Rogers remembers. My family knew Mrs. Lane, who was one of the original uh, starters of the Institute way back. And she asked a friend of mine and me to come and help with the first international ball in 1936. And it was very, very exciting and very, very colorful and beautiful. Colorful and beautiful because guests wore costumes of their native countries and the food served was also of foreign flavor. Was there a, any class distinction, like someone who was a plumber in Czechoslovakia. Oh, my goodness, or no. Oh, anyone, this anyone. No, no, it was not for the elite. It was a real ball. Beyond the parties, Boston's Grand Dames performed some real hands-on work as well. The memories are post-World War II for Rosina Coolidge. Her mother sponsored hundreds of people fleeing their ravaged homeland. And they would always come and stay with my mother and father for a few days. She just loved it, and then she'd find them a job. Rosina recalls one story about a man from Pakistan. She said, well, what can you do? And he said, well, I'm uh, back at home. I was an elephant trainer. <laughs> and so my mother was always undaunted, and she called the Stoneham Zoo and said, you need an, an elephant handler, maybe the word is, and, and uh, so they said yes, and off he went. I come from Cuba, and I came to this country in 1963. Tomas Dominguez is living the American dream. Part of this success I, is all to the in, in, International Institute, because what's an inspiration for me. Inspiration and an education. At the Institute, he learned English, and with the money he earned from his first job cleaning floors, Tomas started a business. I think my business was built uh, more in courage than, in, than money, because I started this business with $248. His business, New England Ethnic Products, is a major supplier of produce and groceries to the region's Spanish population. I think I have what everybody dreams when I come to this country, I have my own home, and especially I grow a fantastic American family. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. These are words engraved on the Statue of Liberty and the inspiration for the International Institute's Golden Door Award, an honor bestowed on those who have passed through its door. Who else has received the award? It is Yo-Yo uh, Ma, Yo -Yo Arthur Ma? Fiedler, mm. that's a lad. there are a whole bunch of people that, uh, it's a big name. Dr. Farouk el Baz of Boston University. It is a recognition of two things. The fact that within the United States of America, an immigrant can come here and can work well and do something tangible, and then he is immediately recognized for it, no matter what his background is and no matter where he came from. Today, many more people are coming from war-torn parts of the world. These are the faces of refugees. Westy Egmont, executive director. Is today's immigrant different than the immigrants of years gone by? Yes, we're more colorful. We're less Nordic, we're less Central European. But are we any less successful in uh, making America the, the dream country of days gone by? No.
Emphasis in the 90s is more on social services than social activities as in years gone by. And do you approve? I should hope so. <laughs> it's necessary. Yes, it's really very necessary. It is also the end of an era. As the Institute approaches the turn of a new century, its Back Bay heritage will be assigned to the scrapbooks. The stately Commonwealth Avenue mansion has been sold. Having a prestigious address all these years has paid off. $135,000 was the purchase price back in 1965. Rosina's father helped make the deal. I can just remember my father moaning and groaning, saying, oh dear. It's so much money to spend and... And your father has been proven correct. Yes. The asking yeah. price would be around three million. Yes, yeah, he, he would be thrilled. And that three million dollars constitutes the sum total of the Institute's endowment. That money will go toward buying a new building to serve the more culturally diverse neighborhood downtown. We'll be